Okay, so I believe we are going to first to look at the um, the graph. Okay, this is object you can create for in MATLAB, and there are a lot of functions have been built around the graph. Graph is a network itself. So we are going to try to see how can we construct or get a graph into the MATLAB and then take advantage of all the building functions in there. Then um, we will look at the, the basic function in single cell, uh, basic GA2, the basic function for uh, mostly will be gene uh, network, okay? Then uh, in single cell G, GA2, we also have this 10 fold suite, okay? So this contains both network comparison uh, virtual null card and also single cell 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 interaction detection. So this is a package we developed in our own lab. Uh, those functions can can be accessed through R package, can through Python. But uh, if you use single cell GA two, you can have uh, this graphic user manual to select, especially uh, convenient if you you know which cell type you want to focus on. So you have a, this, this manipulation. Okay, at, at the end, I will systemically review what you can do with this MATLAB 2, and I will emphasize on anything which above, beyond DE analysis. We certainly can do DE analysis. Of course, everybody wants to do it. But after that, what do you want to do? Okay, what's the problem with the DE analysis? Okay, the, in MATLAB, the graph is, a very basic data type. It has already been built uh, within this MATLAB itself. So MATLAB mathematics and also graph and network algorithms. So a uh, graph is object. Object is a variable and hold a lot of parameters or features or variables you can call and uh, then define this. Uh, then you have all this functions can, uh, can be applied to graph. So we needed to create a graph. You create a graph and assign this graph into a variable named G, okay? The easiest way to, uh, to create a graph is to prepare uh, a JSON matrix, you know, a JSON matrix is a graph itself. Um, so we will look at how can we create this A matrix. You can also, uh, using other different ways, you can provide the name of uh, uh, nodes. So if you pro pro provide a list of uh, items in the variable S, so you have S1 uh, items, and then you have connected items uh, in T, so they're, they're linked, appeared as pairs that you can create a network in this way. So let's jump to this way, and then we will go back to uh, the adjacent matrix. I jump to here to show you the example, use S and T. So you can copy, if you like, copy this code and put in. So what that means is S and T are two vectors, contains um, 
the node. Okay, in this case, the node has just numbers. What here means the first item S is connected with the first item in T. So one is connected with two, one is connected with four. Okay, so you have two lists. In this case, the G is ready and they say, okay, there are eight nodes. So if you count, there are eight number. Uh, so it's from one to eight. Okay. And uh, the length of S or T is uh, the edges. There are 12 edges. Is that clear? Okay. Um, then you can just plot G. You get this graph. This is useful. It's, it's actually you have a, sometimes you collect the data in this way. Okay, you have two lists and you know they are linked. Um, <clears throat> the other way is to create adjacency matrix. Yeah, I still have this. So if you have a graph like this on your mind, or you, you, you can start by uh, type or create the adjacency matrix for this graph. You can give it a try. And the adjacency matrix is a squared matrix. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, five nodes, so this adjacency matrix should be five by five. Most of the position in this matrix should be zero, means they're not linked, but the position one, two, or two, one, it should be one, and the two, three should be uh, one. So let's just create this matrix in uh, MATLAB by type that in. So I view, See A, okay, so you know how to type this. Um, the first position is one, one should be zero because we don't have a self loop. So one, two should be one. Uh, one, three should be zero. One, four, zero. One, five, zero. So this is my first row. Uh, two one uh, two one is one two two zero two three is one two four zero two five one it's my second row okay My row three will be for for node three. So this should be zero itself, three to one, zero, three to two, one, three to four, zero, three to five, one. Okay. Node four, zero for itself, uh, four, four, one, zero, four, two, zero. Zero, four, four, zero, four, five, one. Five, one, zero, five, two, one, five, three, one, five, four, one, five, five. So you finish this long string. 
Okay, let's check. There's something wrong with, it's not symmetric, so I know. Uh, so I need that this is wrong. Yeah. I think I made a mistake. I don't know where it is, but the third row, row three, this one here, this should be zero. What? Is that the only mistake I made? Okay. Okay, good. So I can check is symmetric. A, okay. Yes. Now we have this adjacent matrix defined. Of course, this is not, not the best way in practical. Um, in, in reality, you want to use correlation, build a correlation matrix, and then I'll show you later how to do. So now we will create a graph from the A instead of define the two vector list. Okay, I'm going to plot a G and give the output of my plot to a variable P. The reason I want to manipulate or change this graph uh, print out later. You just confirm this is the same graph we have here. Okay. One, two, right? Okay. Now, as I said, this graph, uh, the plot return a uh, variable P. This variable contains the uh, properties that you can change. For example, uh, node color. Okay, I change node color into red. And it gave you the new property of this, this graph, okay? You, you just type this P, the variable, the variable name is the whole thing here. And then tab, there are a lot of other uh, properties you can. Uh, each color, something like that, okay. So the P is an uh, object called a graph plot. Okay, so those are the selected list of the properties you can use. If you want to see, okay, what the other properties I can change for this P, the graph plot, you can click this to learn more. All right, so I will change the age Wait, maybe.
Okay. Any questions? No, good. So now we are going to create a slightly larger uh, network. In this case, I'm going to see A is a random number 20 by 20. So now this is a weighted network. Okay, the link have a weight value associated, not just zero or one. Can you do this directly? The problem is this adjacent matrix is not a symmetric. Okay. In this case, I want to use directed graph di because from node one to two and from two to one are different values so we need to have a weight and you can do the same thing uh, say plot this is fully connected I start to see this uh, errors so from one node to another and also bike there are different parts this picture is a fully connected graph because every uh, position from one node to another they're fully linked to their values um, we can do something to make this uh, more realistic because we can we want to remove some of the links what i can do is to uh, see i will find a uh, value greater than 0 0.7 and only keep those okay this operation will found the index in a this value so the random number is between one and zero uniformly distributed so if i only keep those value greater than 0 0.7 i should keep I reach 30% of the links only. Oh, let's see, made a mistake. <laughs> uh, let's, let's restart this. So if I do, so A become a, a vector. So I will redo this part. I still create this random uh, matrix. Now I will found index A uh, greater than 0 0.7. Then I will do A, A with this index. Oh, well, those index become zero. Uh, no. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, so anything which not greater than 0 0.7, so this to the this, uh, symbol, just reverse the, the logic from true to false, then uh, all these items will be assigned to zero. So that's the operation.
there are many, many different ways to do this, but it's just one way. Um, so I can start to do Now I use this filtered adjacent matrix gave to the uh, directed graph and then plot this. Is that okay, everyone? So I'm going to show more uh, properties of functions you can apply to here because this contains 20 uh, nodes compared to the, the small toy example we create manually. This gave you more uh, selections. The first still we can uh, color the edges, okay? The same. Color the node, color. We can plot P and lay out. This is a function. Okay, the layout allow you to select. There are several ways you can uh, rearrange the position of the nodes. For example, if you select circle, uh, this graph will change this layout. You can try others, okay? This is for a 3D. Uh, so if you do this, then maybe you can rotate the graph. Another question is how can you convert uh, the asymmetric adjacent matrix, make it become symmetric? So how can you change? Uh, so mostly you take uh, the link between one, two and the two, one, you sum it and take average and give the average to to both one, two, 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 one. So to make it symmetric. The operation is like this. So if you have A plus A transposed, then times 0 0.5. So you make a symmetric A, okay? So B becomes symmetric. So this is my A version, and then if I do the G version of the graph, now uh, the B version, which is G2, and the G2 is symmetric, I can still plot it. Okay, on your left is the symmetric version of the, my original asymmetric version of the network.
Another question for you is, how can you remove this self loop? So the self loop is defined in the diagonal position of your adjacent matrix. If it's non-zero, you have this self loop. Otherwise, you can. Uh, so let's look at the B. Um, if you look at the position of a uh, diagonal position, so one, one, two, two, three, three, they are zeros, four, four, five, five. By chance, but the, when you when we reach to seven seven, and this position is zero point nine, and you start to see, okay, there's self loop in node number seven. Okay, if you want to get rid of this, uh, you can uh, do an operation like this. You you pick diagonal position of B. So this will return a vector contents in the old diagonal. If you look at this, this B, and you can see the value here in the seven, okay, there, there, point nine. There are other uh, 19 and 20, 19 and 20 are self loop. So diagonal position has these values. Other places are zeros. Uh, what you can do is with this B, you do another diagonal, this function to reconstruct uh, so the answer is here, to reconstruct a matrix where only the position in the diagonal position contains values from the B, okay? And then you can use original big B minus this. So that, that's what I'm going to do. Diagonal, diagonal again to the B. Give to B again. So this operation will remove all the diagonal position uh, values and set it to zero. I'll check B. We can do uh, G2 again and the P2 to pull out. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is small b. Two rows here. This is not a two rows. It's just oh. the whole uh, whole matrix when they print out. The last two items. Um, yeah, for this one. Uh, yeah. yeah, above this. Okay. Yeah, so this is not just two row, it's a 20 by 20. Yeah. Is you get it by uh, doing this diagonal function again. So this diagonal take the vector and make it a, uh, a matrix. If it, if you gave it a matrix, it gave you the diagonal position of a vector. <clears throat>
Now we are going to take a look of this graph G2, okay? Um, so G2, if it's our focus, then you can have, uh, you can get adjacent matrix by type G2, G2 dot adjacent matrix, adjacent. this will return basically the A, uh, the B itself, return this. It returns a uh, not a full matrix, but it's a, it's called sparse matrix. It's only labeled where the connection is. Only the position non zeros have been uh, given. This will uh, save a lot of memory space. If you want the full matrix, you can do full matrix, and then it gave you back the full matrix. That's a, what we can do, okay? We can also uh, compute the centralities. So there are a uh, function called centrality. And then you got to uh, give the name of which one you want to compute. So you tab and select Degree is the simplest one. Okay, you can have degree. The result will be written to a variable called a C. Okay, stand for centrality. So the C will be the value of degree for each node in the graph. We have twenty nodes. So it's twenty by twenty. This is matrix. So. We should have a C as a vector contains 20 uh, values. So those are the deg degree. We can try other properties. Uh, this They provide betweenness, centrality, closeness. Eigenvectors. So eigenvectors is very similar to the cusp uh, index we mentioned. Okay. Page rank. Page rank is a Google algorithm. So to rank the page of the website. So for example, we can see okay, what's the page rank centrality value for those nodes? Okay, so you see. The first node is zero point four seven. Some others are higher. So once you have this C as the values, we can see okay which one is the the largest C. Okay. So the the maximum value for this is zero point zero seven five five. But we want to know which one it is. We can see, okay, index. It will return number 11 is the highest. Number 11 is this one. So it has degree 15. It has a highest page rank value. Okay, remember your graph is a P2, we can highlight. Highlight this index. Remember P2 is your uh, graph plot. And you select P2 and ask for this function. Please highlight the index number 11. So it gave you this, okay? Slightly uh, big bubble here. I don't know if you can change this highlighted values color. Uh, Yeah, 
But anyway. Highlight node color become red. Oh, so I should do this index and also give the color to be red. So this will change this particular highlighted node and what's the color should be used. Okay, I can also select the top Top five, for example, I can see max K gave me top three. Okay. Instead of just the, the largest value, I want the top three. So now I have three nodes that have been selected. Now I can do the P2 and highlight this top three in my graph. Okay. They have a highest page rank value. So I encourage you to come back to this documentation and look at this um, graph and the network. There, are, uh, <clears throat> how you construct, how you modify edges. You can you can add nodes, remove nodes, add links. So you have manipulation of all the, the topology, and you can. Subtract, okay, extract the sub subgraphs. You can count the number edges found the nodes. Um, those basic operations. And in the analysis of structure, you have centrality, okay? You should be able to click in and to learn more about each different in index in there. And you can see whether the whole graph is connected. How many components? If you have a, a isolated subgraphs, you should use this to see. Okay, I have a two fully connected compo uh, components in the network, or three, or just one. Uh, there are other uh, operations for this. Okay. The graph, you can export adjacent matrix, and also there are different other ways to represent the graph in, uh, in matrix, okay? So this is called incidence matrix or Laplacian matrix. It's convenient to have this uh, shortest parse those functions. Let's give it a try in our example. So now I'm going to search for my graph G2. I still use G2 shortest parse. And from node one to 12, okay? So this gave me a parse. Uh, let's call it parse TT.
or from one to two, just direct link. It's not a good example. So let's from what from a two, let's move to from two to thirteen. Okay. So that's my uh, shortest parse searched for my uh, for the parse from a two to thirteen. You have to go through uh, sixteen. Let's make a long, longer pass. So from a, yeah, but this is a, almost a fully connected. So there's no very long pass. Maybe from a, let's see from a 10 to six. I just want to illustrate Also, just one step, two steps. Anyway, so we can highlight P2 and highlight this parse. The parse is from node 10 to 6. New color. It's hard to see, but uh, you can you can find the parts which has been highlighted in in red. So this parts, I ask this graph search method to see from ten to six, it goes from eight and it jump to six. Okay. You can do this for all pairwise nodes from, from all parts. I found this is called the maximum flow in graph. Uh, the other distance, short distance. This will make sense if you have a weighted graph. So you have uh, from one node to another, and uh, maybe by step, you have more steps, but by the length of the distance between each node, then the distance is the shortest. So they are possible if you have a weighted graph. And remember, we use the function called the minimum span tree. So if you want to visit all the nodes in the graph, you construct a tree, and then this tree will cover all the nodes that are linked but the total uh, summation of the parts of the tree is minimized. Okay, if you uh, have time to read through this documentation, there are many different ways to, for example, to customize the plotting. Uh, there are many, many options you can see. I can want to highlight, I want to label, use different color, different topology for the same graph, uh, 3D, 2D, you, you name it, okay? Something like that. It's all possible. So you see in this case, you uh, marker uh, the parts by the weight, extract subgraphs and found the links and label individual uh, graphs highlight and anytime you can just export this into pdf or gpeg whatever format you want okay i found this very convenient by the way
This is interesting. Okay, I think we can take a five minutes break, if you like. Any quick questions for this part? No? In the bar function, mm -hmm. can you calculate the edges? You have a lot of function. You can calculate the index for the edges as well. Edges means a link between, between nodes. Oh, yes, it's a lot of function which only apply to connected. If you have a graph, they are separated, small island and module. Uh, some of this algorithm won't work because you don't have a information from one node in this small sub-network jump to another. So the distance is infinity. Uh, so you, what you can do is you can extract the largest components, analyze it separately, or you can make a link artificially maybe, yeah. So I never try those examples, but you can click. And once you have this uh, interactive manuscripts, you can just click this run and all by steps. This uh, small example provided and it should be running by itself within this uh, documentation.
Okay, I, now I want to show you use real single cell RNA-seq data. How can you construct a gene co-expression network? And also you can try how to construct cell population networks. Cell similar together should be put in the same modules. Okay, let's do that. So we are going to create Uh, example data and then uh, matrix and do the coding directly here. So I will first clear my space, close all. I, also, I will use example data from there. Okay, now I have a 7,000 genes. Um, let's first do extraction because I don't want to mess up with all the cell, different cell types. I want to construct a network only for alpha cells, okay? So I select alpha cell, select. So my network will contain 6033, close this. And the gene, I want to do a quick filter to remove. Remove the gene, express less than 10% of cells. Well, 5,000, 5,000 by 5,000. It's still a little bit too high. Let's set up as 15%. Yeah, I just created this reasonable size of matrix for the demonstration purpose. And then now I can export this into the workspace. So I have, I have a variable to work on. So I can select export X and G. This, these are the genes, these are the expression matrix. Okay, once I have these two variables in the space, it also have this SCE object, so I can safely close this window because all the information I want to extract is already there. By looking at this, um, see there are a lot of uh, uh, zeros, of course. So they're not very good for computer correlation because if I have zero in the 80% of the position, you only use 20% of the position to compute the variability, the, the, correlation. So uh, I tend to uh, do an imputation, see, XM, so we can do run magic, impute this matrix. It's done, so this XM looks like this, okay? All right. So now from XM, I can extract the first gene expression like this, okay? I will transpose position. So this will be uh, X1, so first gene expression. I can see, okay, my second gene expression is 2x2. So uh, you can just confirm, okay, this is just a vertical version of the 
fourth row of XM, and this is second row of the XM. Okay, nothing fancy. Just uh, I can compute the correlation between X1 and X2. By default, this R is the the correlation of expression between these two. Now, instead of compute this correlation pairwise, so I instead of loop from one, two, one, three, one, four, two, four, two, in this way, I, uh, I want to do this for the whole matrix at the same time to get this big R. I'm not so sure I can do this, but I, I will give it a try, okay? So if I gave the whole matrix, I hope this correlation function is smart enough. It, okay, let's see R. So R, yes, uh, it's there. So R is a matrix of 3,050, uh, 3,750 by 3,750. And we know we have so many genes. So this R matrix is a pairwise between all the genes correlation. And we know the first two genes have a correlation 0 0.359. And if you look at your R matrix, this position is symmetric. Okay, the value is between these two, all right? Make sense? Just give the whole matrix, just compute the pairwise, all the variables. You have to transpose this, otherwise it will give you a cell by cell and the correlation across the, uh, all the gene space. And now we try to do this gene network, so it's about the genes. So now we have R and this R is should supposed to be the symmetric. Okay. Uh, let's see, it's supposed to be, but because of this uh, uh, numerical, this offset, they're not 100% symmetric, but we can, we know it's symmetric, okay? But this, this function test require uh, more stringent. What I, I can try is something like this R minus R transpose. So this number should be very small, okay? Just confirm this is a symmet symmetric. Because R minus is transpose, the, the identity uh, the same, okay? Almost. Uh, so that means we can use R as our adjacent matrix. I think the problem is we have negative values. There are some genes negatively correlated with another. Uh, so we have the problem. Also, we want to get rid of ones in there. So I'm going to do this trick. So R uh, minus diagonal R uh, diagonal. remove the diagonal position, okay? Make this become zero, uh, become zero of the position. Uh, let me think about how to filter out this. Uh, negative values. We will have a problem with negative values.
let's do this and see what what happened. Okay, number one is not uh, symmetric. Also, okay, so we have to find a way to make it symmetric. So what's the trick? It's zero point five times r plus r transpose. Now it's symmetric. It is. Now I can give to the graph. Okay. Okay, so this is undirected. So I don't know what the how this uh, negative value is traded. So I can export this adjacent matrix out. I want to check what the adjacent matrix looks like when this R matrix is given to construct the network. Especially I want to look at the negative value, whether the negative value is trade as zero or still be one, or still be one. So this is a fully connected network. Okay, not very useful. You see what I mean? Okay. When you give R into the graph, this graph construction function, you will look at each link between two nodes. If it's non zero, it is put one. If zero is still, but in our case, we don't have zero here. So it's a fully connected seven thousand. So I don't want to plot it out. You can try, but then maybe it will stop your machine. So don't plot them. So I'm going to uh, do a filter to remove some lowly correlated links. Um, so I will do R if on the index. So R absolute value at S. If this smaller than say zero point zero point three five. So I select those position. I'm going to set all those positions into zero. Okay. So now R all this index is set to zero. Remember to put the semicolon symbol at the end, otherwise you print out all the values on the screen. So now I do this filter to remove those loaded link. And then uh, maybe it's not strong enough because I see a lot of 0 0.8. So let's just remove more. Okay, I will remove anything which smaller than 0 0.75. Okay, now I only keep those strongly correlated. Now I can give this graph, uh, reconstruct this graph, G. Okay, let me think, I can plot 3000, let's plot it, P. Um, do one more thing here. I probably can give the name of genes. I don't know. Okay, so I gave the name of genes in the same time in the graph. This will kill the machine. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, you highlight, you can see the name of genes, okay? So those genes are isolated. There's only one, this large fully connected component because we set up this cutoff. And we didn't differentiate the positive and negative ones, but as long as they have a link, put them together. <clears throat> So there are other ways that you can extract this linked component and get rid of those genes, which uh, isolated, okay, to create this graph. Uh, that will use connect components, the G, okay? So there are some operations you have to do, okay? So when, uh, Subgraph ID give me three uh, G small. Okay. Oh, so I, I uh, subgraph. Yeah. Something like that. So I only extract the first the component, then we uh, pull out the P again. Okay, so in this way, I just extract the major component. Those unlinked genes have been removed. Okay, so for this small graph, you can uh, compute the centrality, for example, G small uh, with centrality. I will try to which one have this eigenvector value of the largest and the max. Top three of them. Can I have P highlight them? In the graph. I have to find where these three genes, which have a highest eigenvector concentrality. Oh, I should highlight them in the right color. They are here, so I have I found these genes. Um, it's difficult, too many genes, okay. So I can zoom in. I try different way, okay? Uh, this is small. I 
the computer is frozen. So those are the three genes I found by the index, by sort, by the eigenvector centrality, and who is the top, who is the second. So those, those are the genes in this small network and have a name of this, okay? Same way you can uh, build a cell-cell network. All right, so now I'm going to use the interface. So now we have still have SCE in the variable, single cell experiment. So you still have this, okay. So to build a network, you just click this button, right? And you know that uh, you select some random gene to build a network for those genes. So this graph is created in the way I just show you in, uh, in command line here, but I highlight those uh, negative correlation use different color and the blue are the positive correlation. You can uh, change the layout of this. You can filter. Uh, first, you can make this. Uh, let's see, change this one side. From directed to undirected. And uh, you can set up a cutoff. See, I want to show only 70% of edges. Remove some lowly uh, weighted edges and then apply this again. This movie just show when you pruning this edges by cutoffs and then what the network looks like. And you can stop at any point. You think, okay, this network is already sparse enough. I stop here. Okay, I can stop. All this is help you to uh, interact with your network. Um, exactly how to interpret those results. It really depends on which gene, which set of genes you are looking at, which cell type. In this example, we can have uh, two different batches. Those cells are from a, a different development stage, week 14 uh, against week eight. So we can compare the network if you select the batch ID. You will uh, select these two groups and select the genes you want to compare the network for. Uh, these two networks will be constructed using cell belongs to different categories. And then you, you receive these two networks side by side. Then you can do the same thing. You can make this become undirected and also remove some of the links so to show the major difference and then change the layout. So you can uh, find, okay, in this week 14, 
there's some link between these two genes, but not in the early stage of development. But in this example, because we selected random genes, so that shouldn't make any difference, shouldn't make any sense. But if you really know those key genes, and you may detect a difference and visually here, and it may explain some of the biology. Okay. Any questions for this part? This is what I mean, the basic operation of the network comparison. Okay, we finish this too. If you ask whether I should create a network globally, you should, including, for example, thousands of genes by thousands, thousands of genes, or I should create this small network, only include 20 genes I really interested in, rather than put this 20 genes in the, the big ocean of a large network. The answer is you can do both. Okay? What we tried using different method to do this local focused small network, the network you build will be very similar to you consider 8,000 gene by 8,000 gene, you construct a big network, then you subtract, extract this 20 gene sub network out. You get the same thing basically. Oh, this just make the adjacent matrix from a, a, a symmetric become symmetric. Yeah. And the method we use to construct the network is called a PC regression, principal component regression. It gave you the different values for different pairs of genes from two direction. So gene one to two will have a different values from two to one, but largely they are same there. Yeah, they're numerically different. And in theory, we should be able to detect if you you're only one direction, but uh, in real application, we always found this not, uh, so the two values will be very similar to each other. So you can just make this whole symmetric, uh, matrix become symmetric. <clears throat> That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, yes, highly variable G should give you more active information. If you include a lot of ribosome protein, uh, you just make uh, make a one additional node in the network, but not very informative. That's that's true. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to use the same uh, example, example here to, to show this application that we build for uh, network analysis for the, from single cell data. And if you click this network, this menu, you see, okay, uh, there are gene regulatory network construction using PC regression without subsampling or with subsampling. So without subsampling, we will uh, just use the matrix directly to do the PC regression to construct the network. Otherwise, uh, we use that uh, subsample 500 cells each time and do this 10 times. And uh, 
use tensor decomposition to denoise and then collapse those. In theory, maybe with subsampling, we can get a slightly better network in theory, but we haven't really compared that before. It's the, this, this just without subsampling, you just put everything, build a network, it's a single network. Well, this will build multiple networks and take average basically. Uh, this will be much faster, okay? So that's one turtle, there are two turtles here. Uh, so I can try to click this, just make sure you want to build this network for all the cells that you select, at least they all from the uh, same cell type. So it makes sense to build a, a network for itself. For genes, yeah. So that's a common line you can use. Okay, so this is use a PC net. PC net is for PC regression. And it just gave this expression matrix and it will give you the adjacent matrix A. So that's a network. Okay, this three is almost, yeah. I don't know, so this may take two minutes. So make sure you know what you are trying to do when you really need to have this global, the transcriptome level of the regulatory network. Otherwise you should study this subset of genes, 20 by 20 small gene sets. So after this, then we can do this comparison and we will uh, repeat the same procedure, but for red cell and the blue cell separately, build the two networks and do an alignment. That analysis will give you a list of the gene, which are differentially uh, not expressed, differentially regulated in two networks. I didn't know this will take so long. Uh, I hope you haven't been trapped in here. If it's not the case, you can try uh, single cell 24 net, okay, without without the subassembly. You just create two networks, you directly compare. Or you may want to filter out, see, remove more genes to make a smaller network that make your computation faster. This will take forever. Okay, so this is a construct network. This is a compare network. And then from here, you can start to do the virtual gene knockout. So you can select a gene. See, I want to knock, knock it out. And then the program will construct a network before and after knockout and give you a list of genes. See, the list of genes will tell you once you knock that out, what will happen. Uh, for the rest of genes, which gene, which other genes will be impacted mostly. So that's uh, the option here. So all this analysis with a lot of turtles here, so don't expect to have them finish in uh, by seconds, it take some time, okay.
this one here. Turtle, you don't know what's turtle mean? It's a warning message, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we already discussed this before, and you need to install Python version of this. 24 XCT for interaction detection. Now you have a two cell types. You select the founders pairs. And the last items here, if you have two samples, then for example, in this case, you have 14 weeks against eight weeks. You can do the interaction between two cell types respectively, and then see which interaction changed greatly across this time sample. We cannot run this in here because we don't have different cell type. There's only one cell type in each this batch of data. Yeah, I think that's I, all I want to share with you here, okay? The rest of them is between uh, is regarding uh, the D analysis. You know you can do the D analysis by click this this here and then you select the cell groups okay, by batch ID. Uh, it will give you a table. The table will tell you okay this gene. What's the expression level in this group of cell, what's the expression in that group of cell, and what's the difference between them, whether they're significant or not. And also the, the sign, whether it's up-regulated in second sample or down-regulated. So a, a big table. Then you have to decide. So I want to have a folder change greater than some cutoff to select those DEGs, whether I want to put up and down regulated G in the same report, or I want to report them separately, then whether you will consider p-values or not, what's the combinations from your p-value with all the change value. So there are a lot of things you have to decide yourself. And here also we have another category for this gene expressed in how many percent of the cells whether you want to set up a cutoff, say I only consider the GA expressed in both cell groups have a percentage greater than 5%, or I want to consider they are completely in, uh, shut down or not expressed in one population, so that's a percentage is zero, and another have a 4% of expression. Whether you want to keep those genes as upregulated genes or not. So once you set everything up and when you change the data set, you have to reset all these values. Otherwise, sometimes you get five upregulated genes, sometimes you get 500. So that's why uh, I, I don't think this DE genes make any sense analysis. So you can change your cutoff, whatever, you get more or less unless you're happy with that. And also, you know, because of the variability of the cells, uh, and this variability expression is the most important signal. And when you average them up, you lost a lot of this variability change information. Then the gene you detect 
which most important functionally, they should not be DEG anymore. They, they are in the middle of the, uh, the uh, you know, list. Um, so you should try a uh, highly variable gene, okay, for the same set of the cells. You should compare the networks. You should use those tools to, to find the differentially regulated genes across this network. And this network comparison also will help you to identify the gene expression change. Because if you have a gene completely not expressed in another sample, the network certainly will change a lot for those genes. So you naturally will collect those genes. Uh, you should start from considering uh, a gene set directly rather than detect the DE gene individually, then look at their uh, belong to which gene set. You should start from a gene set, for example, this button here, allow you to select a set of genes according to compute a signature score for each cell so that you compare the cell populations. Okay, give them a try and if you can have access for those. So what else you need to know? So I try to cover everything on our agenda here. So the network is here. Yeah, <clears throat> Hit the map so you select uh, the compare two groups. Uh, some genes. Yeah, it's just two groups, those genes. So if you want to see how long you get the hit map as well, I export the yeah, so I don't know if you can export. From from this interface? Yeah, just you go to the Oh, average gene expression in the two groups. Uh, let's see for this one uh, for those values they are they are not they are just individual cells because you have so many cells in this group the summary will be the average will be average across the cells for example this mt1 gene expression in week eight so each column here is 
that G, that sales expression. And when you take average, you certainly get just one value. Should be the same, yeah. I think the difference between here is uh, you can either have this U map, uh, not U map, UMI count, uh, take average. Or uh, here, probably we did a normalization, the library size normalization, then log plus one. So that makes a little bit different. No, if you if you export this value out here, that's just a count. It's just the counts of UMI, and then there's no. Oh yes, this is. Uh, this average, there's no transformation, whatever. Yeah, this is a raw data. Two different batch, yeah. So this is a direct UMI count average. So we use this to do the transformation? Normally you should, yes. It's similar with the library size. Yes, you should do the library size first, yes. So maybe I can add one more step here. So when you compute this, whether you want to do this library size normalization, then take a log. I think it's, I think it's different. I, I yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think the difference is because whether normalization has been done or transformed by log plus one, okay? Mm hmm Already finished? Okay. So I'm almost there. Really? Uh, I don't know. It's a, it should be the same same name as genes. Yeah. So if you do this. Um, Find the old markers that give you. It should have the same name of gene. Yeah, yeah. I don't see why there. What's the reason you found a different name of genes? Because the, the name of genes should be old from. Same genes with the p values. So on the heat map, when 10 genes are shown up, they are just randomly selected from the 10s. Oh. Oh. oh, what the Shrent said is when you run this, found all markers, there are many output, the all p values are the same, but you cannot plot them all in the heat map. You just randomly select five. From top ten. So if you check the p values, all of them should have the same. Yeah, yeah. If you go back to the 
So I'm going to make this uh, matrix smaller by remove, I need a 25% and see how many genes left. This still, this should be okay. Uh, let's remove all the mitochondrial genes, uh, remove all the ribosome port genes, I want to make this smaller so we can have a quick computation. Thirty percent. <throat> so with this number of genes, we can try compare two samples. Okay, without uh, subsampling. In this case, uh, the program will let you to select which two groups you want to compare. So we want to compare week 14 with week eight. And then it start to compute and build the two networks and then compare, give you the, the gene list. The other way is you can have uh, two networks and then to compute their centrality for genes. For example, you do uh, the network for week 14 and you compute all the degree, all the uh, closeness centrality for all the genes. Then you do the same thing for the network constructed from the cells collected in week eight. Then you see whether those values change greatly. Uh, so this is a, a straightforward way to find the, find the gene, have a centrality value change greatly between cross networks. We tried that before, the gene set you get is not as good as you do this way, okay. On the market, there are very limited numbers of these uh, network comparison methods you can find. If you have any good reference, let me know. Um, so we, what we are doing here right now is to, to run uh, single cell and if for net to compare the network between these two sample two cell populations. You can see the message on the screen there is trying to construct the second network for another group. I think that our demonstration will stop after this finish, okay? As we remember, when you do this network analysis, make sure uh, you construct this network for same cell type. You don't want to miss alpha beta cells together, construct a, a network which you cannot interpret downstream. Uh, when you compare two networks, make sure you know, okay, same cell type in different conditions, 
compared to each other. You don't want to compare two different conditions with two different cell type, and then you don't know how to interpret it. You can control for the cell type different conditions, or you can control the same conditions. You can still compare alpha cell against beta cell. That's fine. Okay, so result is saved. Okay, the result has been saved. Uh, you will see this list of genes. Okay, this gene is the most different one. Okay, and this is the second. Because we can take a look of this list of genes and put into enricher and see whether they have encoded for some shared function. Okay, I only use 22 genes on the top of this network difference. Um, I don't know whether they make sense or not. This is from alpha cell and the different development age of uh, uh, mouse pancreatic eyelid eyelids. Okay, so those genes may make sense to the people study this. What I found is the neuropeptides signaling pathway changed. Okay. Any other questions? Later. Mm -hmm. The p value is depends on their uh, manifold aligned, whether they uh, the distance is, yeah, based on distance. So we made it up. So you can design your p value test. Okay. So we, we don't look at the p value, we just look at the rank. Okay. On the top ones, is most likely to be greatly impacted. So you can uh, you can see I want to keep those uh, smaller than 0 0.05. You can keep moving down. You can see I have I keep top 50 or keep one top 100. Doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Yeah. Any out? Questions, last questions for the semester? No? <laughs> these two networks, this, we do the comparison, the network is doing it based on the PC regression. Yeah, PC regression. Yeah. Yeah, I encourage you to try uh, virtual knockout, see, knockout a gene, see what happened. Knockout another gene, what happened? Yeah. Also the network. Yeah, knockout generated knockout network without knockout compare. Yeah, okay. Yeah, if, if you have any other questions, technical questions found Yunjian and me in the in lab, okay. Yunjian is not here this week and he will come back. Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah.